All right, here we are with another episode of the Groundswell Origins podcast, and I'm so stoked to introduce you to Sean Thompson. Welcome to the show. Good. It's great to be on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Amazing. And and I'm loving the back the background in the yard you're at. So you're calling us or reaching us from Santa Barbara, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Just we're just actually moving into a into a new house. We're hoping to get in like tomorrow or the next day. So uh yeah, we bought an old house, a lot of renovation. It's oh, and, process. <laughs> and and so that's right on the heels of you having your your thirty fourth wedding anniversary. Is that correct? Yes. Yesterday, we, uh, my wife and I, celebrated our our thirty fourth anniversary, which is, uh, I think, one of the great achievements of my life. <laughs> For it, anyone that's it, been married a length of time, you know that uh, there's a lot of love and passion and heat in marriage, but there's a lot of work too. And, and uh, that is an amazing together. accomplishment. What would be your one piece of advice for somebody that, like myself, who um, this is my second marriage and we got married two years ago, actually in Maui. What advice would you give me? I would say be kind. Kind's good. <laughs> yeah. Just be kind. yeah, awesome. Do you guys surf together at all? No, my wife's not a surfer, but but we've been in business together, and and uh, you know we like we like to work together. We uh, we my wife ha- has a, a strong personality, uh, as do I in certain areas. So uh, it's not like there's fireworks, but but we have uh, we have some lively discussions, and uh, she's very very talented and anything to do with a house it's it's very easy like for anyone you know a lot of people say uh, when you do a home renovation it can put a lot of strain and stress on a marriage and some marriages don't survive a home renovation um i go my wife makes the decisions it's simple she uh, and, and it's just so easy that way when a contractor comes in and you know starts asking me about paint color and paint chips and positioning and I'm going, it doesn't work that way you don't ask the husband and wife you just ask the wife and it's really easy that way there's no gray area and I just let her make the decisions and that's awesome I'm stoked I, I love her um, her judgment and I and I love her style uh, so it's easy well, it's relevant for me because we're literally starting a home renovation project. And today I had the guy quoting on a basement fireplace. Uh, I live in Canada, so in the winter it gets a little cold in the basement. So um, I'm going to take that to heart for sure. So if you don't mind, I want to jump right into um, a little bit of your background. You know, many of you that are listening, you may or may not know, you know, being a world champion surfer. Um, built, you know, started the surf industry um, with one of your brands. That's one of my favorite brands, actually. Um, and then what's transitioned from that to what you're doing now, if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of touch on some of the things that you're doing. If you could give us just a little overview of the historical history that's led up to, you know, uh, well, let's just say, you know, you getting into business. What was that like? Because it's been a number of years now and your trajectory of career is just incredible. But I'd love to give people a little backdrop. Sure. I am. Um... I was a pro surfer for many years. I competed on the tour for 16 years. Actually, even longer. I surfed in my first pro contest in 1969, and I retired in 1989. I won 19 major events. I was the youngest guy to win. I was the oldest guy to win. I think every single one of my records has been broken by Kelly Slater now. Um, but I loved it. I, you know, I, I, I loved surfing. Um, I think I was a creative guy, I was a determined guy, um, and certainly helped create the surfing industry. My first brand, which I started when I was um, 24 years old, was called Instinct. Um, And for anyone out there that is thinking about starting a brand or starting a company, it's wonderful if you can create something with a name that has a resonance. And it's not just a, a collection of words that are, that are, are put together that don't really identify uh, connectivity uh, with the core passion and the core essence of, of um, the brand. And I call my brand Instinct because the best moments in surfing are tube riding. It's when you're riding inside that spinning tunnel of water and you think that you're in perfect sync with, with the ocean and the world. And uh, you think you can even... I mean, I used to 
think that I could bend that, curve that wall to my will. I, I felt that I had that incredible power of the mind and talent to be able to do that. And the best tube rides happen when your mind is free, um, when you're operating on instinct. Uh, so I called, called my first brand Instinct and, and it grew successful. Uh, Can we just touch on Instinct real quick? Yeah, Instinct yeah, is yeah. I, one of the first ad campaigns that I just like loved. I literally paid the surf shop to buy the posters that were in the shop and I still have it today hanging in my garage. No and way. I want to ask fun. you some questions about this. These are like, I'm, I'm literally scratching my own itch. I've been dying to ask you this question. So you had a campaign and, and you'll know, yeah. you know, which one. The, so one of the first ones um, is uh, waiting for waves is okay. Yeah. And some people spend their lives waiting for nothing. It was That's so right. popular. So that ad, who came up with that? So we, you know, we were up against Quicksilver and my cousin's company, Gotcha. And then we had Hang 10, Lightning Bolt, these sort of Ocean Pacific, these sort of legacy surfing brands. And, and we really wanted to do something that connected surfing, connected surfers to, to the essence of surfing. Uh, yes, it was important to have like pro surfers involved with the brand, but like how can we connect the brand to the tribe? So we thought what we'd do uh, was create a series of almost like vignettes of, of the surfing life and encapsulate them with, with some beautiful prose that was like poetry. So we had this super talented guy, a guy called Rod Dyer, who's like a legend in the West Coast ad business. I mean, worked for Madonna, where you know, he's created these unbelievable brands and logos, just like a legendary dude. Um, and he brought in this, this great copywriter called David Lees. He had the hottest, at the time, they had like the hottest agency. I couldn't even believe they wanted to work with Instinct with our tiny little company. But it really, um, it helped explode the company. And I think it was the first, and I would say, to this day, one of the only um, campaigns that has been built on what makes surfing special. Not pro surfer going upside down at 100 miles an hour, winning the world's biggest surfing contest on the world's most rad wave. That, that's not what surfing is about to 99.999% of the people in the world. They don't care about winning a world title. They don't care about riding Nazare. They don't care about a, you know, a 50 foot aerial. They care about like what makes surfing special to them. And like waiting for waves is okay. Most people spend their lives waiting for nothing. And um, uh, it struck a chord. It just, and I, you know, people like surfing is life. The rest is details. That was on. I mean, I would walk through a bloody Walmart and they ripped it off. You know, football is life, the rest is details. But that really struck home with surfing. They're like, surfing's life. And the rest of it, it's like, it's just mm -hmm. the details. You know, you know what I mean? So people really responded to it. And it was interesting that that people think, oh, surfing, surfers just respond to imagery. No, they don't. Because the images that we had were just like a group of us on the beach, like kicking back. That's what I was going to say. The pictures, what stood out, If so I'm going to I'm going to actually, just so you know in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to all these ads that we're talking about. I love that one because it was nondescript. It stood out because people were just sitting in the lineup and it wasn't even like, it was sort of like even not even that great of a photo, but it felt yeah, real. The photos were a little bit, they, they weren't even that super duper sharp. You know what I mean? It was like. <laughs> yeah, it was but, sort of, but although the one picture that was beautiful was another ad on the same campaign says, either you get the wave. That was me, yeah. You, you get that the was you in the, the picture, picture, yeah. yeah. Beautiful so, shot. It looked like it was at sunset or something. It was sunset, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, good, you got a good eye, yeah. That was, uh, that was sunset. So it, it showed me that uh, surfers are way more spiritual, way more philosophical, um, and way more connected to words than one would think. Because surfing is an unspoken act. You know, you just paddle out there. It's not like, uh, you know, there's sort of uh, instructions and it's, it's, it's not like football, baseball, basketball. 
it's it's just unspoken really but words speak to the soul of surface uh, it was very um it was, it was wonderful and it really it really put the, the in, instinct on the map and and then I, when I retired from the tour, um, I, I sold Instinct to my partners, and um, I went back to university. I'd had a couple of credits outstanding in a, my university degree. I'd been studying uh, economics and and business finance. And I completed that, and then um, uh, my wife and I ultimately moved to the United States. Uh, we had our, our first son the same year I retired. Uh, Matthew, and then we moved to the United States when I was, when he was five years old. I got an offer from this amazing company who no one, this this was a small company back then. It's it's, it's most probably the, one of the most well-known companies in the world today. But when I joined Patagonia, uh, they offered me a job. It was amazing. And I worked there for two years. I had never heard of the company. I think I'm the only employee that Patagonia has ever had that had never, ever heard of the company. When I walked down there, I knew nothing about the company um, and, and went down there for an interview. And as I drove in, I remember I saw there was a, a little school right to the side of the HQ. And, and I asked the crew, I said, what's this? They said, no, that's our school for the um, it's our kindergarten for the kids. They had their own school. I went, wow, what an amazing company. And then the more I learned and the more I became friendly with Avon Shinoda and his wife, Melinda, and you know, learned about the philosophy and ethos of that company, um, I knew I'd, I'd come to the right place because back then the, the surfing industry was profit, sales, and growth. It was, the, it was the, you know, the pyramid of power, profit, sales, and growth, um, whereas Patagonia had purpose. And um, I learned a lot from Yvonne. You know, he would tell me every time I do the right thing, it's the right thing for the business. Even though at the time, you know, you've got like a, Profitability wasn't there. I mean, we launched organic cotton. It was so abysmally unprofitable. But it was like a statement. You know, it was like a line in the sand. And the margins, you know, I remember starting out, the margins were like 18% um, on, on like a flannel shirt that was bought in Portugal. And generally, you know, the margins on Patagonia product were like 75%. So, um, you know, he, he made some hard decisions but like you said you know when you do it when you make a decision for the right reason the right reason ultimately ends up in in profitability and today i would say it's most probably still publicly held by the by the Chenard family it's most probably one of the most valuable brands um in the world today a brand that really uh, speaks to purpose speaks to uh, a North Star. So I worked for them for two years, had, had, had a great time, learned a lot. Um, and then my wife and I started a brand called Solitude. And we wanted to bring uh, both the environmental responsibility and the social responsibility that Patagonia had to, to the surf market, but in a premium sector. So you know, our products were, were expensive, beautiful, first sustainable fabrics in the surfing industry. Um, we use beautiful models, tent cells made from beech trees and all. It's just we, we were like 20 years ahead when, you know, my mates would say to me, well, you know, yeah, you're a granola cruncher now. What's happening with all this stuff? And, you know, they were flying, you know, Billabong and Quicksilver and all of them were just on, on their rocket ride during the, during the, the 2000s. Um, and we had a good run with Solitude. We sold in brilliant stores, Saks, Barney's, Nordstrom's, Bloomingdale's, all the, all the fancy department stores, the best surf shops, great outdoor stores. Um, and then uh, we just got a, a phone call one day and we got an offer to sell from a publicly traded company and, and they bought us. Um, and then we stayed on for a few years, my wife and I. And then when... When we, a few years, maybe, let's think. It was actually, it wasn't that long after we sold. Um, we lost our beautiful son, Matthew. Uh, he he uh, was just for a semester at my old school in South Africa with my wife. They'd just gone down there because we wanted to get him to connect with the old homeland culture. And he played a dangerous game. 
called the choking game and killed him. This was terrible. Oh, terrible. At that same time, I was, I had a book at the printer, my first book, it was called Surface Code, uh, 12 Simple Lessons for Riding Through Life. It was just a, um, it was a, an, uh, an autobiographical book. Uh, and um, so it was a very, very tough time. Everything came to a halt. I, I didn't, didn't publish the book for a while. Um, and then, and then I um, decided, no, I've got to publish this book because it's in memory of of my boy, and it's about my boy. Um, so I published the book, and the book became popular. And people started asking me to come and talk at organisations and schools and universities and conferences about a code, because people were fascinated with the code. Um, so I'm going to ask you. Why did you come up with the word code? Because code is like, it's like you're going, that's the standard. Yeah, because I think. Can you so can we talk about it so people so can actually know what the surface code is? Can yeah, we go so, through them? Yeah, sure. So so, so what happened is um, uh, Surfrider Foundation, which is the biggest surfing environmental group in the world, uh, was founded in 1984. And when they founded it, the, the founder, Glenn Henning, three founders, but the principal founder, Glenn Henning, he found me up, and I was the number one surf in the world at that time. He said, Sean, you know, we'd love you to represent this organization. Uh, we'd love you to you know, be a sort of ambassador. Um, I've been involved with the organization since 1984, and I wrote the I wrote the copy for their very first ad and gave them a picture to use of me and it was me doing a bottom turn and, and I wrote, do a good turn today. And I wrote those five words. So, uh, you know, like, I suppose maybe unconsciously I'd learned from the whole instinct campaign success that, you know, words are important and do a good turn really represented surfing and, and environmentalism. Anyway, a few years later, after I'd moved to the United States and my wife and I had started Solitude, we located it right across the road from Rincon, which is one of the most famous surfing breaks in the world. Puerto Rico, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just an amazing break. So Solitude was located right across the road, about a, half a mile away from Rincon, or maybe a mile. Um, Glenn Henning phoned me up again. He said, Sean, Rincon's facing a severe environmental challenge. Um he said, I want you to help me do something about it, just like with Surfrider so many years ago. He said, I'm going to bring a group of young people to the beach, and I'm going to bring the, the local officials um, and to see if we can solve this problem. And if we can get the kids um, to really become like the representatives of this, of this uh, uh, initiative, to solve the problem. It was like a septic tank issue. Mm -hmm. of this like it was pumping out into the sea kind of thing? Yeah. It, ultimately, yeah. when it rained, the septic overflowed and it pumped out into the ocean. Costa Rica. We had, we had to get them onto the sewer line. Um, so he thought, well, if you bring the kids down and you bring the media down and all these officials down, uh, you know, we can get some, like, publicity around it. He said, I want you to give the kids something. He said, you've got $100 budgets. <laughs> He said, I'm bringing about, I don't know, 60, 80 kids to the beach. So I went home that night and I thought, like, what can I give these kids to get them stoked? You know, at the time we, we had beautiful clothes. I thought maybe I'll give them some gear. And then I just thought, no, I'm going to do something different. And I, and I just wrote down 12 lines, every line beginning with our will. And I wrote down the 12 fundamental lessons that surfing had taught me about life. And I will always paddle back out. I'll never turn my back on the ocean. I'll paddle around the impact zone. I will ride and not paddle into shore. Just so that one there, I will ride and not paddle back into shore. Let's just talk about that real quick. So what does shore. that really mean to somebody that either doesn't surf or understand that? So, you know, it's funny that you, that you picked that one. I have so many surfers come up to me and they say, hey, Sean, why did you ever write that? It has made me late for more meetings. It's made me late for more it's dinners. It's made me feel guilty about paddling in, just so you know. You've got to have guilt with paddling in. I've never paddled in in my life, and I never will paddle in. I will always 
catch a wave. And, and it just represents completion. It oh, represents okay. elegance. It represents, like, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it properly. Uh, you know, you paddle out and there's just that sense of hope and anticipation and optimism. And then what are you going to come in because, you you know, you, you're you going to come in with your tail between your legs. Like, it's, it doesn't work that way. You've got to catch that wave. And so, so that's why I wrote that. Anyway, so I wrote 12 of them. Uh, 105 words took me like 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and and I'd written it on just on a sheet of paper. I'd written it out, and then I thought, wow, what do I call it? Not just a surface code, because the code's about values, it's about commitment, it's about honor, it's about integrity. It's like it's almost like a warrior. Code, it totally but, is. It's it's a, like a business code, actually. I'm reading between the lines code. for these, so for me, I'm like, there's more to this than just, yeah. That's like why I talk, I talk about the code to the biggest businesses in the world, to the top CEOs, to the top C-suites, to huge companies. And I just talk to them about service code. I talk to them about the 12 basic fundamental building blocks of, of character, of, of who we are as, as human beings. But, but this, is, this is where things can laugh is... is is so interesting that you never know where you're going to end up. Because, so now, I've written Surface Code, and I've written the book, and the book's become popular, and I'm speaking at all these huge organizations and schools. And it's like, you know, when I, when I talk about this, it's like it didn't really, it's not real, because it sounds like it's fiction. So I'm sitting in the lineup one day at Rincon, with like 300 of my best mates. And uh, a guy paddles up to me and, and he said, hey, Sean, I'm a headmaster at a local school. My name's Gordon Sichi. In my day, headmasters did not surf. All this headmasters did was cane you on the arse with a bamboo cane. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, can you come down and talk to my students about surface code? Uh, so I go down to the school. It's a small school, 80, only 80 students. Uh, boys and girls, it's uh, eight, uh, a nine to twelve grade school. And when I'm chatting to the kids about surface code, uh, I say to them, you know, I read it in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, what about your code? I just had a spur of the moment idea. So, so what about your code? Why don't you write your code? All of you, write 12 lines. Every line beginning with, well, I don't know why the hell it turned out at 12. I, I, I don't know. It just turned out at 12. But I, 12 is kind of a cool number. Um, it's not like commandments. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's commitments. It's, it's like, a commitment you're saying to yourself ten, that this is my standard. There's 10 commandments. The code is just 12 commitments. And I said to the kids, write your own codes. So about a week later... 80 kids, 12 lines, I get like nearly a thousand lines of code back. And the very first line of code I got back, this was about maybe four months, five months after I'd lost my boy to a bad decision. Peer pressure, I don't know. You know, we'll never really know why he played this game. They all kids played it with their school ties. They all wore school ties at school. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, this young girl wrote, I will be myself. I will always be myself, she wrote. I will always be myself. And I went, wow, that's amazing. And then all these other kids wrote amazing lines, beautiful lines of power, poetry, powerful, power. I will, power. Um, and this is yeah. your son coming back to actually – the, no, the power of the, of the experience coming back and you're seeing the benefit of that. And, his and life this, had meaning, yeah. His life had Full on, and and I don't know. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of kids have written their code. I, I don't know. I do these events where thousands of kids write their code. So I was so inspired by this, I immediately phoned up my co-author Patrick Moser, who's from Drury University in the Midwest, in Springfield, Missouri, and I said, "Hey, Patrick, we're going to write another book, and we're going to call it The Code: The Power of Our Will." And the focus of the book is going to be on creating positive decision-making framework for young people. That's what the book's about. 
help kids make positive decisions, get them to write the codes, get them to write their purpose. So uh, we jammed out the book, we read over summer, and then the book became uh, popular as well. And now, uh, now I get people all over the world, big businesses, everyone writes a code. I'm doing an event um, a week after next in Austin for a huge investment company. They made the biggest investment company in the United States. Everyone's going to be writing their codes. I'm doing a big tech conference down in uh, Huntington Beach. Uh, two weeks time, everyone writes their code. I mean, everyone, they, they just write their codes. And it's very cool because not only is it, is it good for oneself, but it's good for the other people around you because they can see who you are and it creates this connectivity because the world is so split up and, you know, you've got the Republican on this side of the valley, you've got the Democrat on that side of the valley, you've got no bridge in between. And, and, and I like to think that this code is like a, it's like a bridge because it tells people and it shows people when they write their codes and then you look and analyze what everyone's written and everyone writes 12 beautiful lines, but everyone only writes two lines. And our life purpose can be identified as two commitments, as two statements. Our entire life purpose can be, can be formulated, number one, by a statement, I will be better. Number two, I will help others be better. That's it. That's our life. That's our life purpose. That's what we all want to do. We want to be better. We want to help others be better. So we're not just on this champion's quest, on this hero's journey. No, we're not. We're on a hero's journey for ourselves, but also we're on a hero's journey to uplift others. That's the way life works. I've seen it. I've looked into the soul of millions of people. I've just been in the fortunate place, and surfing gave me this gift that ultimately turned into this thing. And I've had this, like, look into the hearts of people and it's just been such a honor from all around the world too like we're talking like Everywhere. your experience the hasn't just school. been in, it's all over the planet i'm talking the poorest schools kids yeah. got nothing except hope and they write unbelievable words and these words empower them they empower their fellow students empower the teachers get everyone stoked so the goal i want to get I want to get millions of millions, tens of millions of people riding their coat, create a positive wave around the world to break across this world and free us from this darkness, this despair, this disconnectivity, this pessimism, this hatred, this unkindness. Code can help, man. When people look inside their souls, you know what they find there? They find goodness. Mm -hmm. They find the two words better. I want to be better. I want to help others be better. That's it. We want to be better. Absolutely loving this. You know, I'm really clear about my mission, which is um, I'm a groundswell for good, generating ways of change that transform into a tsunami of stoke that we all experience as one. I know it off by heart. I'm really clear. Very about cool. That. Yeah. So you want to make, you want to help others be better too. So you see, there's a um, there's this sort of unanimity of purpose here that there's a lot of people in the world that just want to help others be better and they want to be better themselves, but not at someone else's expense. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened now. People think that it's got, you've got to be a winner. And you've got to yeah, well, and, and it, win if someone who's a loser. Now? Like, do you, I feel there's a real shift. And the shift that I'm seeing is if you look at the news of these companies, of, of the employees are going, hey, I'm not, the leadership is not aligned with our values. We're revolting. I see yeah. this as a positive shift that's happening in there's so many negative news and I'm actually seeing brightness. And one of those is to what your core purpose is, which is helping businesses have purpose. I think businesses without purpose and congruent direction are actually comp competing in a negative zone where it's changing it's where changing. your people want to be part of something like that. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the stats, you know, <clears throat> they do these big surveys, Deloitte and, EY, they do these surveys. So the interesting one, I spoke at a, a large leadership conference at Rotterdam School of Management. 
you know, and there were these massive companies there. Philips was there and Royal Dutch Shell. And I mean, you're talking big outfits, you know. And I'm speaking, you know, their CEOs are speaking, I'm speaking. But some interesting statistics came out of a, 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 a and like leadership, a, a purpose led company. So companies that their fundamental purpose is not just profit, sales, and growth, but doing good for the community, doing good for the environment. Purpose-led companies perform 42% better than companies that are simply in business. So, like, for any businessman, you look at that and go, whoa. It's like talking top-line and bottom-line revenue if you have a sense of purpose. And then what about this? So they did a study of 76,000 people. So they did this, like, longitudinal study. So this is a study over a long period of time. Um, Having a sense of purpose means you're going to live twice as long. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. Twice as long. Well, because the idea of retire I've heard the stats of people that the idea of retirement, they, they, they have nothing to live for. They're like, this is all, this is it. But people that maintain a mission in life, they tend to live much longer. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's such, it's such incredible research just about this. And, and people say, oh, well, what can I do? How can I find my purpose? Finding your purpose is really easy. Pick up a sheet of paper. Spend 15 minutes. Write 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. There's your purpose. There's your power. There's your path. Simple. There's your purpose. There's your power. There's your path. It's really easy. 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. Do it with your family. Do it with people that you love. Put it up on the refrigerator. Print it out. Put it in your wallet. Um, that's your North Star, that's your purpose, not my purpose. I just, I just fell into this whole thing. I, I love that this has come from surfing, because <laughs> come from you know, like born Lincoln. from surfing. Most people, in their imaginations, they think of like fast times at Ridgemont High and surfing, and they don't realize that there's so much cerebral and 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 life lessons and um, so much wisdom that comes from the experience of being a surfer. And this is one of them that's I think is just you know incredible. Yeah, no, it 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 it, it, it was just, it was really special that it came from a very pure, pure place, and um, you know, it, it's sort of a, it's like my son's. It keeps him, it just keeps him alive forever. And mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, you know, Jews, you believe that the soul never, the soul is always alive. The the soul is, you know, the soul is eternal. That spark, that fire, that light is eternal. It is. And, you know, energy is, is never lost. It's always just moved somewhere, right? So mm -hmm. we're energy. So if I was going to ask you, you know, your definition, what's the definition of groundswell to you? You know, I think groundswell is just a wonderful um, um, concept. Um When I, after I wrote Surface Code, the code, the, not the book, the little code, um, I actually spoke at an event, and the, the guy, Glenn Henning, who started Surf Rider Foundation, also has a foundation called the Groundswell Society. Mm -hmm. um, and you and him are on similar paths, that there are these unseen uh, pulses of energy that can transform positively and negatively, but certainly um, you're on a positive path as is Glenn. So, so this notion of groundswell is very, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful metaphor. And, and from a surfing perspective, a pure surfing perspective, you know, groundswell is a swell that's created from a very, very strong storm uh, a long way away from shore. So when the, waves come to you they very well defined they very long and generally they're quite far apart between 14 and 17 seconds apart the frequency uh the wavelength of the of, of the wave so uh, it has this um, the metaphor associated with is is one of power it's one of energy 
but it's one of unseen energy and you only really see the cause not not the cause you see the effect so the cause is this like energy this power um, and then you see the kind of transformational result in the form of these amazing these amazing waves beautiful yeah I, you know for me groundswell also the the double meaning of it really becoming from, you know, thing, people rising up and coming together on a cause and a purpose and mm -hmm. looking for starting a movement to create change and ultimately transform, you know, what they're trying to aim, their aim is at. Um, you know, I just think it's such a powerful metaphor and, and visual of what we're talking about, which is purpose. Like, I think that um, when you have a code, you help these businesses, like it sounds like you're doing with purpose, there's a different type of potentiality for growth, which is you're, you're, you were saying like, there's this, the, there's the stats are there. They, they Patagonia maybe initially seemed slow, but now it's exponential growth. Mm -hmm. There people are buying based on values or shared purpose. And I think that's one of the things that I'm helping. And I think you are as well. It sounds like, and tell me what your thoughts are about the idea around people wanting to be part of they don't want to buy products anymore. They want to buy into your business. What is your your take? And what have you seen when you've helped people change their purpose and seen the outcome? It sounds like you've done it with your own business. But what are some of the things you've seen, these patterns that that from someone that's listening, a lot of people are in business, entrepreneurs, in the marketing advertising agency. Those are my a lot of people listeners. And for them to really see that this is this is like a powerful direction to take. Can you share a little bit more about your insights there? Yeah, you know, it's not new. Yeah, it's um, not. In fact, one of the great management leadership theorists of all time that I studied back in the 70s when I was at university is a guy called Peter Drucker. And if anyone hasn't read about him, you should. And and you, I would encourage um, listeners pick up one of his books you can buy it on ebay it's about a three or four dollar book and it's called the five questions by peter drucker and uh he says that every business ngo any organization needs to go through a process of self-analysis and introspection which is pretty much what everyone does when they do the code write their code but you need to to um answer five questions, just five. And um, the very first question is what's your mission? Like, What's your mission? What's your purpose? And it's got to be short enough to fit in a t-shirt. <laughs> That's what he says. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he, he's, he's no, no longer alive. It's just an amazing thing. So like, what's your Which mission? Which is not That's easy. Like, like being, being easy. brief is the hardest thing to do in marketing, right? Yeah. But it's got to fit on a T-shirt. It's like but you get life, clarity rest, you surfing yeah. is life. The rest is details. You know, waiting yeah. for waves is okay. Uh, so I, I think that is really good. And then and you know then he's got you know the four other questions that 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 you need to answer. You know, who's your customer? Uh, what is your customer value? Pretty cool. Like who's your customer? Who is your customer? And, and what is your customer value? Like, what is your customer value? And it's like, today, the customer doesn't just value the company for the product. They value the company for what's behind the product, for what the product itself represents. So out of the first three questions that this genius is asking, two of them are about mission and purpose, okay? Mm -hmm. So what's a mission? Who's your customer? What's your customer value? What are results? Now, here's another profound concept. Like, what are results? Is a result I want to have 30% year-over-year growth for the next 10 years? Or, you know, what are your results? Like, I want to create fundamental social change. I want to create a groundswell. I want to create a positive wave that breaks across the earth. You know, what are results? So he, he, he is an amazing theorist. You, you know, he was always about like, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. 
that's paraphrasing one of his 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 uh, uh, theories on measured time energy. And then the last one is like, now what's the plan? What's the plan? So it's really, really, it, it's it's a good way for any business person to become a little bit introspective about their business in a very simple but incredibly powerful and transformational way. And as you can see, back then, I mean, I think he wrote it in the 70s or 80s, it was still primarily about purpose. And he was like way, way ahead of his time. You know, way before what's the why and Simon Sinek and all these, you know, guys. Um, you know, he's the original, I think, one of the original sort of fonts of wisdom and management and leadership um, theory, but purpose drives us, man. Purpose gets us up out of bed. Purpose is the stoke. Purpose is the fire. Purpose is the mojo. Purpose is... Man, it keeps us alive. <laughs> you, know, you, go, is... you, go all the, you can go all the way back to the 40s uh, and Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, that mm -hmm. book. And he talks about fundamental purpose and attitude and how that's the difference between life and death. You want to live? You've got the attitude to live. We've got the attitude just to let it go. You've got the hope. Um, yeah. So he, here's one thing that I think is actually very different in this culture that's, a, that's happening, it's a, emerging, is the result. So you mentioned, you know, like, what is the result? I believe consumers, partners, suppliers, the world is now paying attention to the result, not just the purpose, but what is the impact. And it, you, they want to play a role in, like, they don't love seeing businesses that are <clears throat> being profitable without making an impact or sharing or contributing, or even though that might be a purpose, profitable is, is great, but being part of that, what is the result? is I think where people are really playing a, a different sort of question where it used to be, oh, you say you're doing something great for the, you know, the world. Um, that's wonderful. It stops there. My product is great. Now people are going, I want full transparency. I believe this is like, like blockchain. Blockchain is an example of total transparency and trust. Um, I think people want to have a different level of trust now with, with brands and businesses. And that, I think that's emerging. What are your thoughts on that? No, I do. I, I do think that people really want their brands to stand for something. Um, it's 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 really interesting the way that um, our economic structure works in that you buy a product. And is that all you're buying? You're buying that product. And the profit from that product is going to a group of shareholders that are ultimately going to get rich. But you're the person that's bought the product, and all you've gotten is the usage of that product. Um, I think that there's going to be this shift. And, it, and, 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 and I do think commerce is going to move towards more of an egalitarian model in which the consumers that are responsible for the profitability and the revenue should in some way, shape or form share in success beyond just usage. Do you understand what I mean? I 100% do. This whole concept, and I think this is going to be the next wave, this concept of participatory social entrepreneurship. So that the people that are responsible for, wow, man, I got this new product. I got this new iPhone 13. It, the, the product's amazing. And everyone that holds Apple stock and the managers at Apple are benefiting. But what am I getting? I'm, you know, going, oh, it's, it's not such a good product. You, you know what I mean? It's like there has mm -hmm. to be more of a division, I believe, of, uh, of benefit. This is just economic theory that I, I think that is, is, is going to be sort of the next wave of, of business. It's like there's like this, this, this convergence, right? 
there's another one that's coming up, which is people's values. It used to be, I'm part of a club or I'm part of a religion or church or whatever, right? And now some of that um, requirement that used to be over here, we're now placing on with brands that people were going like, this is my identity. I'm wearing this. I think people feel like their identity was their church. And now sometimes people's identities are with the brands. Um, not saying wholeheartedly. I'm, I'm not want to make a, a, you know, a podcast or something. People are going to, you know, say I'm somehow making brands are about religion. But what I am saying is I think people are really going, there's more meaning to everything I do. I want this purchase. And, and if I'm going to represent and wear it and be part of this, I want it to be, I want to be participating in a bigger picture of it. I want it to do more. I want to feel my money is doing more for me because your values are aligned with my values, something mm -hmm. of that nature. And I feel like this is the younger kids are more demanding it than, than my generation. And I kind of think that they've got it right. Yeah, I do think that uh, that there is this incredibly strong tribal element to the to the successful brands, and and they they have to do the right thing today. Brands have to do the right thing because they know that their constituency demands it. You know, their constituency demands that they're socially responsible. Demands that they uh, environmental and environmentally responsible. And, you know, I think initially, like, Patagonia took that lead because it was just something that Yvonne believed in and the team at Patagonia believed in. And they kind of brought people along with them. Um, it was more of a, a top-down... Uh, it was more of, like, a, a top-down from the hierarchy of the organization into the community, whereas today it's more bottom-up. Um, and it's it's great to have seen this uh, this power that is now sort of vesting in the community with um, economic success. It's, it's, it's like it's 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 very very closely uh, tied in there. It's great to see. It's, I mean, it's I, almost I really shifting it's it's leadership, good. true leadership, because leader management is top down. Leadership means bottom up follow, like, and and they're part of it. Like, you got to lead people. To me, that's that is it's always leadership has always been there. I don't want to minimize that in any way, but it feels like that's the switch. Is when when you think about Patagonia, you had a visionary leader, but he he, from my understanding, and I, you are close to this, so I don't want to, you know, say something that's not true or inaccurate, but. My my thought is he's had he was really great at activating empowerment across the organization yeah, at was. a key level. Yeah, he used to say uh, he used to say I have the MBA theory. You know, he 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 wasn't a, a university educated guy, uh, Yvonne, but he was incredibly sharp, smart, well read. But he's, he says I subscribe to the MBA theory, management by absence, <laughs> because he was always <laughs> he was always like on some like rad expedition somewhere. Uh, I have did. that's that ties into my philosophy, which yeah. is ambitiously lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really divested, uh, I think, the uh, you know control to to the team. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, but, but I, I think it's uh, it's exciting what you're doing. I, I, I like this whole groundswell concept, and it's it's uh, you know you know hopefully that your crew that watch you and listen to you, uh, you know, have found some of the stuff that I've been saying are interesting. And I always encourage anyone, you know, if they want to get in touch with me, I'm always active on LinkedIn. They can always email me. It's just go to my website, seanthompson.com. I love to interact with people. You can interact and tell me how you thought I'm a wanker or you thought it was good, whatever. Just, uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, I, I, li I like to interact. I like to get into discussion. Love it. This was such an incredible interview. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, do you have anything, any parting words that outside of now we know where to follow you? What's the URL that you like people to follow you? Uh, you can go, uh, I, I do a lot on, on, on LinkedIn. I, I love mm -hmm. LinkedIn. You know, a little post a little bit on Instagram too, but LinkedIn I do, um, I'm, I'm always posting up interesting, uh, I yeah, I follow you. The, That's how you and I connect. Thought, yeah, thoughts on LinkedIn. Um, but I, I would encourage people to 
to just pick up a sheet of paper and spend 15 minutes and just write your code. 12 lines, every line begins with I will. And once you've done that, or do it with your spouse, do it with your husband or your, or your wife, or your, do it with your children, um, put it up on the fridge and, and leave it there. It's very um, cathartic, connective, uh, and transformational process. And it's a lot of fun too. And it's just, it's challenging to get down and just get your 12 lines down there. Like what's really important to me. It's, 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 it's a special process and I'm hoping that people do it. I'm going to try. I got a group of salespeople I'm coaching on Thursday, uh, 40 people, and I'm going to do exactly your exercise. Yeah, um, to do. One, one request. Sure. A little bonus request. We've got a little bit of time. Is I'm wondering if you'd be okay with reading every one of the surfer codes. I'd like to get it on audio with your voice. Sure. I feel it'd be amazing. Would that be okay with you? Sure. I'll tell you what. I, um, I encourage everyone. Like, I made a little card, and I still carry it around with me in my wallet. And this is like over 20 years old. Um, and every now and then, you know, when things go sideways in life, I'll, I'll look at it. I'll look at my words and reread my words. Even though I know them off by heart, I still like to have them there. It's, it's sort of, it's like my, um, I don't want to say it, it's security, but it's, it's important to me. So I'll read them all to you. Thank you. I will never turn my back on the ocean. I will always paddle back out. I will take the drop with commitment. I will know that there will always be another wave. I will realize that all surfers are joined by one ocean. I will paddle around the impact zone. I will never fight a riptide. I will watch out for other surfers after a big set. I will pass on my stoke to a non-surfer. I will ride and not paddle into shore. I will catch a wave every day, even in my mind. And I will honor the sport of kings. <laughs> so every one of those can mean what you want it to mean. I'll never turn my back on the ocean. For me, I think of passion. I think of danger too. Awareness of danger. I will always paddle back out. I think of perseverance and resilience. I'll take the drop with commitment. I think of power and commitment. I will know that there will always be another wave. I think of hope and optimism. I will realize that all surfers are joined by one ocean. I think of camaraderie. I'll paddle around the impact zone. I think of awareness and self-awareness. I'll never fight a riptide. I think of just this awareness that there are these massive trends that flow through society and sometimes you just can't fight them. I suppose I think of humility. I'll watch out for other surfers after a big set. I think of kindness. I'll pass on my stoke to a non-surfer. I think of mentoring and teaching. I'll ride and not paddle into shore. I think of elegance. I'll catch a wave every day, even in my mind. I think of hope, I think of optimism. I'll honor the sport of kings. I think of honor and I think of integrity and I think of my father and I think of Jukana Moku. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for giving the explanation of each of those. That is uh, uh, unbelievable. And, you know, thank you so much, like for the code, for what you're doing, anything I can do to help with your cause and the things that you're doing. I'm, I'm happy to, to do whatever I can possibly do. And I, I so Again, thank you so much for your time here. Right. Well, thanks for having me, and and, and good luck. And it's been uh, it's really been interesting. I like the way that you have this sort of novel perspective on business. It's cool. Very cool. Thank very you very cool. much. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, there you have it. We have the one and only 
Sean Thompson, and I couldn't be more thrilled. And until next time, mahalo.